I am Nimosini. You found a niche of my vast domain. Who's who? I'm Jeff. <laughs> I'm Paul. This is Paul. Paul. I have to start. I, I'm not used to reading my own words in front of people, and I, I was sitting back there stressing, and I looked at my screen, and the words kept moving around, so I figured this must be a lucid dream. <laughs> <laughs> so I made you all very nice people. Um, this is actually a full-length play. Uh, it's my first full-length play. I kind of got into writing in an odd sort of way. I, uh, about eight years ago, I was sitting at my desk in a cubicle in Macy's advertising department, and I got an email from the New Yorker. It was a rejection letter. But I had never written anything. <laughs> I mean, never. Not since Space Cat Meets Mars in elementary school had I ever written anything. So I thought, well, I got that out of the way. <laughs> and I, I, I submitted 10 pages to a, a writer's workshop, and I got accepted, and I thought, oh, damn, <laughs> what I've got to actually produce. Um, so it's, it's, it's an interesting process. I don't know how to make it stop sometimes, but I guess that's good. You write it down and move on. This full-length play is a three-character play. The main characters, the three characters are all uh, it's contemporary. Um, they're dealing with post-traumatic stress syndrome in their own ways, but it's from different causes. So I'm not going to get into that too much. So we'll just start. Um, the title is Firestorm or Last Night on Little Bogus Mountain. Prologue to Act One. The time of the play is late September in a remote area of Northern California. The story begins very early in the morning, perhaps just a couple of hours after midnight. In the dark, computer-synthesized music plays a few phrases, a melodic improvisation. The tones are soft, mellow, and resonant. This is an electronic anemometer, an an aeolian harp called wind, an art piece, an oral sculpture, we are hearing the musical representation of Sapphiris, the, the uh, west wind. The setting. Lights up low. We're in a writer's studio dash library, a painfully tidy, tidy room walled with bookcases bearing the expected leather-bound volumes, plus here and there on the shelves small art objects, curiosities, mementos and such. Four or far five large black-framed Ansel Adams-like landscape photos overhang some of the shelves. One notable exception to the monochromatic landscape photos is a brightly colored framed child's crayon drawing. Picture lights on the framed pieces provide most of the light in the room. A cold, empty stone fireplace flanked by French doors center the upstage wall. The room's furnishings, oriental rugs, and art speak of good taste and financial success. Seen through clear story windows upstage center, the night sky glows the deep blue of lapis lazuli. Soundless actinic white flashes of heat lightning begin to illuminate the windows and the sheer drapes covering the doors flanking the fireplace below. Act One, Scene One. Downstage, a man, Buckley, Buck Harold, sprawls asleep on a daybed. He is barefoot. He wears a bathrobe and khaki chinos, and oddly, Buck wears white cotton gloves. He clutches to his chest a book, a locked red leather-bound diary. A rose-colored fold rose folder lies near an empty scotch bottle on the floor near the bed. The empty bottle betrays the fact that Buck has been drinking. The music of Zephyros begins to shift to something ominous and harsh. This new sound is the musical representation of Kakirs, the northeast wind, an ill wind, bringer of badness and misfortune. The cold lightning flashes seen through the windows and doors shift in color to the warm yellow flicker of firelight. The music, music of Kakirs shifts further. The sound is now of voices distorted and unhappy. As the music changes, the man on the bed becomes restive. 
A shadow appears on the sheer drapes of one set of French doors. A woman in silhouetted, is silhouetted in the rectangle of light. Buck whimpers. In his disturbed sleep, he draws a rasping breath. A gust of wind blows the doors open. The drapes stream into the room. Firelight spills onto the floor. Buck rises on his elbow and turns to face the door. He studies something we cannot see. He is transfixed. He stands, then unsteadily steps a pace towards the doors. A young woman, fully veiled in flame-colored diaphanous something, silently steps across the threshold and stands just inside the door of the, uh, in the room. With an awkward limp, the man crosses to stand in front of, yet some distance from, the woman. The ruddy firelight limbs the pair. Buck speaks in name. Diana! Diana reveals her face and opens her arms to the man, inviting him to come closer. Buck removes his gloves and tentatively, shyly even, allows himself to be guided into her embrace. The music changes again, softening and becoming the sound of laughter and children's voices. Diana slides her right arm under his robe, around the small of his back. She places her left hand on the nape of his neck. Buck holds Diana tenderly. She presses her cheek against his. Buck relaxes into the embrace. They appear about to share a kiss. Suddenly, Buck tenses, his back arched in agony. He shudders as he struggles to get free. His robe falls to the floor. Diana releases him. Horrible scars are revealed on Buck's bare skin. Burns where Diana's hands and cheek touched him. Where her arms circled his waist. Buck's hands are clawed and contorted. He stands where he is, arms wide as though crucified. Diana gazes at Buck for a moment and glides back and away and is gone. The French doors close. Buck remains rigid in the doorway. The warm light gilds him. The laughter of the music now seems to be cruel and mocking. A light comes on in the entry vestibule outside the studio, house left. A young man enters. This is Buck's caregiver and houseman, Guy de Paolo. Guy buzzes the intercom at the studio door. Instantly, the spell of Buck's nightmare is broken. The music returns to, this, to the, the music returns to the Zephyros. The lights snap back to the argent hue of moonlight. Buck collapses to the floor. He does not rise. Guy buzzes again and then knocks on the door. He leans in to listen. Mr. Harold. Buck moans. He stays where he has fallen. Guy knocks a second time. There is no answer. Guy tries to open the door but finds it locked. He shouts, Buckley! Still there is silence. Guy quickly exits the vestibule. We next see a shadow outside the studio's French doors. He peers in and sees Buck on the floor. He tries the door but it's locked. He tries the second door which is also locked. He disappears from sight. There's the sound of glass breaking, then a window opening. There's a muffled curse. Guy enters the studio from the bathroom, house right. His right hand is wrapped in a towel. A bit of blood spots the towel. Guy goes to Buck on the floor and kneels by his side. Jesus. He gently and professionally checks Buck's, Buck for injuries. This is the first time Guy has seen the extent of Buck's disfigurement. Mother of God, what happened to you? Buck mutters something incomprehensible, then grabs Guy in a tight embrace. <sharp inhale> Guy tries to soothe Buck, almost like a father to his child. It must have been some nightmare. Jason? <laughs> oh, it's me, Mr. Harold. Buck abruptly releases Guy. He struggles to sit up. Guy tries to help. I'm here. Buck shrugs him off. No! Uh, please, let me help. Buck tries to cover himself with his robe, but he's on top of it. He tries to shield his face and cover his exposed torso. Get out! Unperturbed, Guy gets the coverlet from the daybed and returns to Buck. He squats down to get nearer. Buck grabs the coverlet tightly and tries to hide himself. Mr. Harold, I can help. Don't touch me! Don't look at me! Guy stands and steps back. He turns away. Is there anything else I can do? Go! God damn it! Get out! Guy appears about to speak, but thinks better of it. Clutching his injured hand, Guy exits to the hall, but instead of leaving, he sits in a chair just outside the library doors, though on guard duty. He turns out the light. 
The hall is thrown into shadow again. Buck lies back down on the floor. He finds himself near the diary in the rose-colored folder he dropped earlier. He gently takes them and, pr- and curls protectively around them, lying on his side in a fetal position. He looks out into the night. The heat lighting flashes silently. Presently, Buck closes his eyes and sleeps. End of scene.